years ago when I worked for a, a technology company, I was introduced to something called the ID10 error. Maybe some of you have heard about this. Um, uh, the, the, the role I had, I worked for the developers and um, my, my role in that job was to talk to the people in the service department, in particular the, the people who did customer support. And so I would say, well, what are, what are they having the most trouble with so that we can fix it? And uh, they told me about uh, something called an ID10 error. And since our product didn't have any ID10s, I wasn't sure what they were talking about. And they told me that was the word that they used for problems um, that were user-oriented problems, where the user made a mistake. And uh, they, they, in order to not insult the user, instead of saying he's an idiot, they said, this is an ID10T error. So you can see it's, it looks like that. And they told me about uh, the, the example that I remember, they told me about several, but the one I remember involved a, a plug. Because as, as some of you have had the opportunity to, to see, um, uh, to, to learn, there is a class of problems that, that fall in the ID10T category, which is you forgot to plug it in. And, <laughs> and so um, you call up tech support, and what will they ask you? They will say, is it plugged in? And what do you answer? You say, of course it's plugged in, right? Because that's what people do. And because their job is to solve your problem, they have to figure out a way to get you to plug it in. And so what they do is they say, all right, you may have an ID10T error, so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, do you have access to the plug? And they would say, yes, okay. Well, if you could unplug the device, you'll see that on the little tangs on the plug are two little holes. And sometimes there's material that gets built up, hair or lint or, or a corrosion or things like that. If you could take that out of the plug and, and look and see if there's anything built up in those two holes. Now, this is not the way electrical things work, but but most people on the tech support line don't know that. So they would dutifully go under the, the desk. They would notice, oh, I forgot to plug it in. And then they would make a big show of going, I'm blowing in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would plug it in. And they'd say, OK, now try and boot it up and see if it works now. And sure enough, it would work. But it was this way, face-saving way of telling people, could you plug it in? Because people want a solution to their problem, right? They want their problem to be solved, but they don't want to be challenged. They want, don't want to be told that somehow they may be involved in this problem, that they may be, in fact, an ID10T. They, they, don't, want, they don't want anybody to, to address their, their problem if it involves cha challenging them. So this is, this is the problem, that this is, this is the, the nature of tech support in a lot of ways. We want you to fix the problem, but don't challenge me. Don't tell me it's my problem. And, uh, you know, the sec I will tell you the second one we don't like is don't tell me it's the other, the other vendor's problem. You know, the, the, you know, it's their fault and, you know, come back to us later. So, so we don't like to be challenged. We, we would love to have them fix our problem. We don't want it to involve us having to make any changes. And this is, this is you know, nothing unique to uh, user, user service. Um, many of you can think about places in your own lives where you'd like to have uh, a problem fixed, but if anybody suggests that maybe you have a role in fixing that, then you would bristle. So, so you say, well, gosh, I just can't seem to make my, my money go as far as my bills. And, and the person is looking at you, and the one thing they know better than to say is, well, maybe you shouldn't spend so much. You know, you should work on your spending. Because we resist that idea. We, we want the problem fixed. We just don't want to have to make any changes of our own. And, you know, that, that works in all kinds of areas, in our relationships, in, in our use of substances, in, in uh, our sexual expression. There's all kinds of ways where we want the problem fixed. We recognize there's a problem, but we just don't want to have to make any adjustments in our own life. We, we, want, we want to fix, but don't challenge me. And, you know, uh, same thing, you know, if you scale that up, it's a, a big part of why our politics are so wrong, right? We elect people to office and say, fix the problem, but don't come back to me and tell me that I have a role in fixing it. You know, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions or we're talking about uh, runaway government spending and bu uh, record budget deficits. Whatever it is, fix it. Just don't involve me in having to make any adjustments. So we have this problem, right? If you think about COVID, right? How many of the, how many of the uh, people who were hospitalized with COVID had um, comorbidities, many of which uh, can be addressed by lifestyle changes, but nobody wants to be told that, right? Nobody wants to be told you should get outside, you know, do some exercise, you know, work up those vitamin D levels, things like that. No one wants to hear that. We want a pill, or better yet, a shot. 
And so that's, that's the way our public health uh, system is designed to respond because nobody wants to be part of the solution. They just want the problem solved for them. And the, the good news is this is not just a, a, a you problem or a me problem. This is a human problem. It happens everywhere uh, down through the years, and we see it um, in, uh, throughout the, the, the Bible as well. We see it in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the, the New Testament. And that's good because we can learn from them instead of having to, to learn the hard way ourselves. Um, we see this, uh, probably the, the best example of all uh, comes to us from the, uh, the, the book of the prophet Samuel, um, the, who was also a judge, and he was, he was serving as a judge, he was also a prophet, but um, as a judge, the, the people came to him and said, we're tired of having a judge, we want to have a ruler, we want to have somebody who can solve our problems and not bring it back to us. We want to have a king, we want you to give us a king. And so Samuel is a little bit, you know, bent out of shape by this, so he goes to God and he says, he says, they want a king. They're tired of having me as a judge. And God says, oh, they didn't reject you, Samuel. No, they've rejected me. See, I am their king. And when they say we want a king like the other nations, they're saying we don't want to have the king we currently have. So God says they have rejected me. They wanted a veto over what their king told them. And they can't do that with me, but they can certainly do it with uh, a human king. So God says, all right, they want a king, give them a king. So God says, to Samuel, anoint a king. The first king is, a, is an utter flop, uh, but God says, okay, well, give them a second king. And that second king, King David, was the great king in uh, Israel's history, and God makes him a promise. God tells him, um, this is in 2 Samuel 7, he says, your dynasty and your kingdom will be secured forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God says, okay, they wanted a king. Um, I'm going to give them a king whose throne will be secured forever. So, God has um, given them what they asked for, a, a better king than they could have had the wisdom to ask for themselves. But um, that king grows old and dies. He has a son. And this goes on for several centuries. And each king is not quite as good as the one before. There are some, there are some highs and some lows, but there's a lot of lows. And the, direct, the direction, the trajectory is, is in the wrong direction. And over the course of a couple of centuries, the, the, the kings lead the country into civil war and um, uh, uh, it breaks apart, and then each part of the country is, is conquered in turn. So by the time Jesus is on the scene, by the time of the first century, it has been centuries since there was a king. But Jesus shows up and comes into Jerusalem as that king. God has not forgotten his promise. God is faithful. So we read in our, in our uh, lesson today, we read, after Jesus said this. Now, we're going to come back to what it was Jesus said. But the reading begins, after Jesus said this, he, rode on a, he continued on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And as he comes to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gives two disciples a task. So this is the mountain that is to the east of Jerusalem. And he tells his, um, he tells his disciples, go over to the village um, and get me this donkey that's over there. He says, go into the village over there. When you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ever ridden untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, its master needs it. And those who had been sent found it exactly as he had said. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, its master needs it. Now, for us, that just seems odd that Luke would stress over and over again that they are untying this cult, untying this cult, untying, untie, untie. Why does he say this five times? Well, because he's speaking to people who are familiar with the, the prophecy that this relates to. So in the book of Genesis, there is a prophecy of um, a future king. But um, that's not what's going on here. Instead, the prophecy comes right after, or right before a different line. It says of, of Judah, the, the, the patriarch Judah, it says, he ties his male donkey to the vine. And I've looked at a lot of uh, uh, scholarly work in commentaries, and nobody has any idea what that means. Um, or actually, everybody's got an idea, and they all disagree. So there's no consensus on what that means. Um, he ties his male donkey to the vine. But... The verse immediately before that says, the scepter, 
won't depart from Judah. So it's a promise way back in the book of Genesis that says that Judah will always have a king. The scepter will not depart. And so Luke is, is telling the people, hey, you know, that, that phrase that's echoing around in your head about um, the untying or tying the, the colt to the vine, that maybe they never understood what it meant either. But as they see it being fulfilled in front of them, they're thinking, wait a minute, I recognize this. What? Oh, and the verse right before, of course. And we may say, well, gosh, that seems pretty thin, right? And I've got to admit, I'm a modern person. Symbolism is often lost on me. But the crowd gets it. The crowd totally understands it. So they respond, this is the thing that we've been waiting for. This is the king God promised, that, that there has been this king, and now he is here to take charge of our world. So they brought the, the colt to Jesus. They threw their clothes on the, on the colt and lifted Jesus onto it. And um, uh, as Jesus rode, rode along, they spread their clothes on the road. And as Jesus approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They praised God with a loud voice because of all the mighty things they had seen. And they said, Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. So, so what, what is going on here? Well, the answer is God is doing what he promised. God is giving them the king that he said would always rule. And the reason for that is that God's promises are sure. That um, if, uh, if we may say, well, I'm not sure if God is going to keep his promise, the answer is yes, he will. So um, let me um, take a moment just to, as a kind of a side thing. Let me ask you, you know, how much do you depend on that? You know, this is a question, and you know, there's, there's no right answer, and even if there were, I'm not pointing my finger because there's three fingers pointed back at me, but, but this is a real question for you, is how much are you leaning on God to keep his promises? Where are the points in your life where if God doesn't come through, you're in real trouble? You know, that's a question that's worth, worth considering. Where in my life am I really counting on God to keep his promises? Because he does. And if you examine your life and you're thinking, you know, honestly, there's not a lot of places, you know, I mean, someday when I die or something. But, you know, right now, no, there's really not a lot that I'm leaning on God, that I'm not really counting on him to come through. Then, then I would encourage you to ask, why not? Why don't you lean more on the promises of God? And I think that's just a question that's worth, worth contemplating. Is there, is there something that I've kind of said, well, God has promised that, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to lean against that because, because why? So just give that some thought. So if God's promises are sure, and they are, then why don't we lean more of our lives against God? So in the book of Numbers, we read about God. Has he ever spoken and not done it? Has he ever promised and not fulfilled it? The promises of God are sure. So, God has kept his promise. He has been faithful. He has sent his son to rule forever as the king. But if you know the story, you know how this goes. There's already some criticism. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples. Tell them to stop. We don't know. Luke doesn't spend any time explaining what's going on. Um, maybe they have a genuine concern for him. Maybe they're saying, hey, this, this parade is getting out of hands. You're painting, your, your disciples are painting a target on your back. The Romans do not take kindly to people who show up and call themselves king. Maybe they're really trying to help. Or maybe this is the pattern of criticism we've seen off and on throughout Luke's uh, biography all, all, all the way up to this point. We don't know. But they tell Jesus, cut this out. And Jesus says, well, I can't do that. I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. So Jesus encounters more and more hostility over the course of the week. It starts here, but by the end of the week, the crowd that was shouting Hosanna and, and uh, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord on Sunday, by Friday, they're calling for his life. They're saying, give us Barabbas. So... They have done 
exactly what their ancestors did. His ancestors rejected God as king, and now they have rejected God's, the, the, the king that God has sent. They've rejected the king that God gave them. They have done exactly what their ancestors did. So what does God do? What, what would you do? What would you do at this point? You know, we're not God, but just as a human being, what would you do if you had kept your promise? You had, you know, moved heaven and earth to keep your promise, and the people you, you kept it for rejected it. You know, I think what a lot of us would do is we'd just, you know, walk away shaking our head and say, all right, I give up. There's just no helping some people, right? I just, that's it. I'm done. But I think some people would say, I'll get even. I will force you to accept my, 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 um, my promise. I, I'm going to uh, kill off anybody who has uh, interfered in this and I'm going to you know, impose this by force. And that brings us back to the beginning of the reading. I said we'd come back to this. It begins after Jesus said this. After Jesus said what? Well, he gives a parable. It's the parable of the ten minas, but it, it begins and ends. There's, it's kind of bracketed by this uh, conversation. It talks about a man who uh, went to a foreign country to receive a kingdom. Now, in the first century, this was common. You were a governor, you were a general. You'd go back to Rome and ask the emperor, hey, can I be a king someplace? And, you know, if usually if you promised him enough loot, <laughs> then, then you would get that job. So, um, so this guy goes off to another country to get a kingdom. And while he's on his journey, the people of that place, they send a re representative after him who says, we don't want this man to be our king. We are rejecting, to the extent anyone could in the first century, we're rejecting this king. But he gets the kingdom anyway. So he comes back and he talks to his servants and there's a whole story there. But then he says, oh, at the end, right, once I've dealt with all the minas and things like that, he says, as for my enemies who don't want me as their king, bring them here and slaughter them before me. So, what does that mean? Why are these two stories linked like this? Luke, Luke has gone to the trouble of reminding us what he just said. He said, after he said this, Jesus goes into town. Is he, is he telling us that, that those who refuse Jesus as king will be slaughtered? You know, th there are people who interpret it that way, and I think that there's a, an element of truth in that interpretation. And the reason is that... Um, the reason is that God is faithful. God keeps His promises. Um, in, in 2 Timothy, Paul, uh, the second letter Paul writes to Timothy, he says, if we are disloyal, He stays faithful because He can't be anything else than what He is. That God did not promise, I will send you a king so long as it doesn't upset you. I will send you a king if that's okay with you. God didn't make those promises. He didn't say, this, this uh, promise of a king is contingent on your approval. He said, I'm sending you a king. And so to that extent, it is true. God's promises are sure. You know, that it means what it says. God's promises are sure. But I think that's where the similarities really end. Because, because if you're familiar with the story, you know how this goes. God sent the king. God has already sent the king. It's not a question of uh, the king going off to another place to receive the kingdom. This is the kingdom. This is the king arriving. Palm Sunday is the king arriving. And we know what happens. When he's rejected, he doesn't slaughter his enemies. He allows his enemies to slaughter him. Now, we know the story. Jesus is killed. And on Easter Sunday, we remember that the tomb was empty. Jesus rose from the dead. God gave Jesus new life. And Jesus makes that new life available to everyone who trusts in him. That that is available now to us as well. Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians, he says, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has put their trust in Christ, then that person is a part of the new creation. That they have 
Jesus' new life. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. This is what he does. He allows himself to be slaughtered so that he can have new life that he can share with us. So, what is Jesus doing here? He's telling us that, that you need a fix, right? There's something that needs to be fixed. There's a problem, and it is human nature to say, well, fix the problem, but don't fix me. This is just the way we are as people, right? And if you tell me that I need to change, then I'm going to reject you, right? How do you solve this problem? There's something that needs to be fixed. It's in us, but we resist that fix. There's something in our nature that resists it, and the answer is to give us a new nature. So when Jesus came, he brought his kingdom into being on the earth, and he said, that you don't have to wait for me to return, that this kingdom is already available to you right now. The new creation is already here, that we can have the new life of Christ in us, not to eliminate our problems. It won't make the problems go away, but it'll change the way we relate to the problems. We'll be able to to uh, see them without any double-mindedness or without any defensiveness, we'll be, we'll be able to say, the new life in me is enabling me to see this is a part of my old life that's clinging to me. And I need to lean in instead. I need to step into the new life that God has given me in Jesus Christ. So the new creation is already here. And we don't have to be uh, double-minded. We don't have to be two-faced. We don't have to say, well, I need this fixed, but please don't change me, because we will already be changed. In Christ, we are already changed. And if you are not a Christian, if you are uh, joining us today in worship and uh, you have not put your trust in Christ, this is the promise. Not that someday you'll be slaughtered for your wrongdoing, but that you can already now have the new life of Christ flowing in you and helping you to do the things that our current nature doesn't allow us to do. So, if you're not a Christian, that promise is available to you right now. And if you are a Christian, this is our mission. This is our responsibility. Jesus called us to be witnesses, and he said, I have restored your little bit of creation. I have restored it to God's good purposes for you. You now have the same charge that Adam had. I want you to tend and keep your little bit of of the garden. I want you to be a steward of your bit of creation. I want people to look at you and say, I don't know about Jesus. I don't know about God. I'm not too clear on that. But I look at them and I say the way that they do their relationships, the way they do their finances, the way they do whatever it is, the way that they relate to their sexual expression, the way that they relate to their substances. I look at them and I say, they seem to be managing their little bit of the world better than I manage mine. That's what Jesus is calling us to do as his witnesses, to show that he is restoring creation already and that people don't have to wait for it. God is faithful. God keeps his promises. And Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday reminds us that the promises of God are already available to us. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for everything that Jesus has done for us. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to lean into the new lives that we have in him. Help us to trust, to trust that we are, in fact, the new creatures that Paul declares in your word us to be. Give us eyes to see the places where your old life clings to us and help us to lean into who you have made us so that we can be good stewards of your creation until Jesus returns. We pray this in his holy name. Amen.